Open books, if you will, page number 97. All hail the power of Jesus' name. We'll do all four verses of page 97. 97. Prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race. Ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all to him all majesty ascribe and crown him Lord of all oh that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall we'll join the everlasting song and crown him lord of all we'll join the everlasting crown him lord Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings upon our service this morning as we seek to gather corporately and worship our risen Lord and Savior in spirit and in truth. Let's bow our heads. Brother Jimmy Galloway, would you voice our prayer? All right, you can be seated, and we certainly welcome each of you here uh, to our morning worship service. Even those watching online, we welcome you, and thank you for tuning in and joining us this morning. And uh, we trust that each of you had a good Thanksgiving uh, this past week, and, and, uh, but it's time for Christmas. It is Christmas season, whether we're ready for it or not. It is here. This year has just flown by. I think we say that every year, but it has uh, just went by so fast. It seems like we were just... Uh, just getting started with 2020 and uh, just a few months ago, but boy, it's almost over. 2021 is at the doorstep, and so, but we praise the Lord, and He's good, and uh, we certainly look forward to what 2021 brings and uh, what it brings in the life of our church, and so, but we're glad that, uh, that you're here today, and we trust that uh, you're ready to worship the Lord uh, as we seek to glorify Him. As far as announcements, let me just make a few announcements, and we'll Get out of the way and sing some more, but next Sunday we will uh, offer once again our new membership class for anyone that's interested in joining our church. We uh, did this in September. We'll try to do this once a quarter and uh, try to offer that once a quarter. That'll be in my office, and uh, so if you're interested in joining our church, then be there. It's uh, required for membership. You need to be there at least three Sundays in a row, and uh, this isn't a class that's going to just on go until... Until we finish, we're going to offer it, and then once it stops, you have to wait until the next quarter to take it. And so if you're interested in joining our church, then uh, be here next Sunday for Sunday school, and we'll start that in my office. 
And uh, keep in mind that is required for church membership. And uh, membership is required for service in a lot of areas in the church as well. And so if you have a desire to serve in certain areas, then you need to be a member of the church. And uh, we'll go over all of that in the class. And so keep those things in mind. Share that with someone that you think might uh, want to join the church. And uh, we'll look forward to that. Uh, ladies, your Christmas brunch is December the 12th, Saturday, December the 12th, just a few weeks away at 10 a.m. at Brother Gary and Miss Carol Smith's home. And uh, so keep that in mind, ladies. There will be a gift exchange. If you want to participate in that, bring a gift uh, with a $20 value on it, and uh, you can participate in that gift exchange. That's December the 12th at 10 a.m. at Brother Gary and Miss Carol Smith's home. Uh, the following Sunday on December the 13th, Dr. Paige Patterson will be with us in the morning service. And uh, so we look forward to that. Dr. Patterson is just a very conservative theologian who's been in ministry well over 60 years. And uh, he'll be with us December the 13th preaching in the morning service. And so make sure you're here for that. That'll be a real blessing. And uh, he'll be an encouragement to us, I promise. He's just a great man of God, powerful preacher and speaker. And uh, he'll be a blessing, I promise you. Uh, well, it is, as, as we've already has been said, it is Christmas season, and so, as you know, it's a busy time in the church, so a lot of things will take place, and uh, one of those being our food drive, and so each year we, we will have boxes out on the platform here, and, uh, and then in the Sunday school rooms, we would encourage all of you to bring non-perishable food items and uh, put them in that box, and those will go to those in our church and those in the community that have needs this Christmas season uh, as far as food is concerned. And so I've already spoke with Bob and Miss Kim. By the way, pray for Miss Kim. She has tested positive for COVID, and uh, they'll be watching this service. And so you pray for Miss Kim Beasley and Brother Bob, and look forward to having them back soon. Uh, but she'll have the boxes ready for uh, the auditorium Sunday school class in the next few weeks. But you other Sunday school teachers, if you want to uh, decorate a cardboard box for your classroom, uh, then do that and challenge your kids and your families to bring non-perishable food items uh, to place in that and we'll take those up uh, just until right before Christmas and then we'll distribute those to, to those in need in our community. So keep that in mind. If you want to start bringing them uh, as early as next week, then that would be good. All right, I don't have any other announcements right now. We do have at least one birthday that I'm aware of on December the 2nd. Timo has a birthday. And uh, Timo's working today, I assume, but he's not here. So uh, we wish Timo a happy birthday if he'll be watching this online. If not, we'll get him, get him when we see him. Uh, but are there any other birthdays this week or anniversaries? All right, I don't see any hands, Brother Ken, so no one to sing to this morning. And uh, so let's get back in our song service. Again, page 106. Praise him, praise him, page 106. All three verses, page 106. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, high glory, angel in glory. Strength and honor, give to His holy name. Blessed Redeemer, for our sins he suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrow. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him. Praise him, praise him, praise 
unto the Lord belong. Praise Him. <coughs> praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. One more, page 116. Take the name of Jesus with you, all four verses, page 116. Go ahead and stand with me. Page 116. the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, of earth and joy of him. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, Precious name, oh how sweet, how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Oh, the precious name of Jesus, how it thrills our souls with joy. When his loving arms receive us and his songs our tongues employ. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. At the name of Jesus bowing, falling prostrate at his feet. Of kings in heaven will crown him when our journey. <coughs> Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of him. Precious name, oh how sweet, how sweet, hope of earth and joy. Thank you for singing. You be seated. Karen, here's our special.
could never pay was paid at Calvary. So instead of trying to repay you, I'm learning to simply obey you by giving song and uh, well, we're glad to have Karen back in Texas and I love that song uh, I think the first time I heard it was Karen singing it and then I went to iTunes when I left the church and downloaded it and uh, I believe correct me if I'm wrong that is a Laura Story song I think and she's the one who wrote the Bible study that our ladies are going through and uh, so that's just a great song I always enjoy hearing Karen sing, and, and so we appreciate that this morning. Mark chapter number 6, Mark's Gospel, the 6th chapter. It's certainly good to see each of you. I invite you to take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 6. As we continue to follow the footsteps of Jesus through the book of Mark. We've been studying Mark's Gospel for 15 or 16 weeks now on Sunday mornings. And uh, we've made it to chapter number 6, and we'll begin our reading in verse 30 this morning. Now, we're really going to deal with the whole chapter. Uh, we'll make reference to most of the chapter this morning, but for time's sake, we won't read the whole chapter, but we'll deal with it for the remainder of the message. But notice in Mark chapter 6, verse number 30, the Bible says, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus, and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place, and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately, and the people saw them departing. And many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all the cities. And out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Let's stop there for the moment. The background of the passage of Scripture that we just read is that Jesus had sent out the disciples two by two to preach and to teach the kingdom of God. And as they preached and as they taught, they were just overwhelmed and they were thrilled and they were excited because the power of God had fell upon them and, and the anointing of God was upon them and the Lord really used the disciples in a mighty way. It had been a very, very busy time for these disciples and so as they gather back together, they come to Jesus and report to Christ all that had happened in their ministry and Jesus responds to them after they report back and says, why don't you come apart and rest for just a little while. It's an interesting response, isn't it? Uh, you know, that is something that all the servants of God and all the people of God need to do once in a while. There certainly has to be a balance between uh, the spiritual ministry and physical rest. And as you look at the life of these disciples, that's exactly what they needed at this time. Uh, Vance Havner, the great evangelist, once said, if you don't come apart, then you're going to come apart. And so one of the things that we need to remember as uh, all of us, as we serve the Lord, is uh, that there will come a time when uh, our bodies will need rest, just like our souls need food. And, 
And, uh, but, you know, it was very difficult for them to find a place where they could just get away from the people and just be themselves with the Lord because God had used them and had worked through them in such a mighty way that they had become, in a lot of aspects, like a celebrity. And the people saw them and, and uh, as they came from all the cities and pressed upon them. Uh, you think about how difficult it is in our day and time for, for celebrities and famous people to get away. If one goes on vacation, uh, just give it a few days and cut on the news and you'll have all the pictures of everything they're doing on their vacation. The paparazzi follows them everywhere. And can you imagine how difficult it would be for Jesus to find some place where there wasn't anybody that didn't want to see him, where there wasn't anyone who didn't want to talk to him, where there wasn't anyone who didn't want to approach him and uh, come to him for a need that they had or some kind of healing. Uh, friend, that's the way it was for Jesus at this time. Think about all that we've seen him do up until this point, all of the miracles, all of the, the healing and, and uh, the calming of the storm, the casting out of demons, the, the ra raising from the dead. And so words got around and everybody wants to be where Jesus is. And uh, so that's the way it was in his life, in these disciples. And, and as they tried to pull back a bit, they find that it was difficult to do so because people were just coming in masses and, and droves to, to where they were, to where they were stationed because uh, they had great needs. And the Bible says as Jesus looked at these people, I want you to notice what he saw when he saw the people. You know, it's interesting, different people look at at people in different ways, don't they? For example, if you're a, a barber, you probably look at someone and the first thing you notice is whether they need a haircut or not or whether they got a good haircut or a bad haircut. Or if you're a shoe shine man, you don't look at their eyes, you go straight to their feet to see if their, their shoes need shining. Or, or if you go into a restaurant and you're a, a bigger man, a heavy set man, the waiter probably says, I want that table. He's going to order a T-bone and uh, versus, you know, just something off the the appetizer menu, and the tip's going to be bigger, and so let me, let me serve this guy. I don't know what a funeral home director looks at. Maybe he says a flower would look nice here or something like that. I, I don't know what he looks at, but I know how Jesus looked at people. Now, the Bible is very plain when it says that Jesus saw the people and he was moved with compassion. Compassion. Let me interject this right here and I'll move on. Friend, you're going to go into the world this week wherever you work, wherever you shop, wherever you go for entertainment, and you're going to look at a lot, a lot of people who need Christ, who need Christ in their life. And they're going to have a lot of needs, but friend, their main need is, is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't look at them and judge them because they don't have the right haircut or because they're not dressed the right way in your opinion. Look at them like Jesus did with compassion. With compassion. We ought to be a people with compassion. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be moved in our heart. We ought to want to touch the people and be touched by the needs of people. But as you move through this chapter in Mark chapter number 6, uh, you'll find that in this passage of Scripture there are three different situations. When Jesus was moved with compassion and He met the needs of the people in a crisis. Really you find three different crises uh, crisis is in this passage. And in every situation and in every crisis, Christ was right there with compassion to meet the need. Let me just say this, friend. There's probably as many crises in this congregation as there are people. There's probably as many problems in this congregation as there are people. As many heartaches and hard times as there are people. People, whatever it is this morning that's on your heart and in your life, I assure you, Jesus is here. And He's ready to meet you where you are to meet that need. Let me say number one. The first crisis that came were people with a hunger crisis. With a hunger crisis. You can follow the story as you continue to read in this chapter of how people had come into the desert place. And down in verse number 35, the Bible says it was a desert and that the time is far past. You get to verse number 36, and notice the disciples, what they said of the people. In verse 36, the Bible says, the disciples said, send them away, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread. And so the attitude of the disciples is, get rid of them, send them away. Uh, there are no McDonald's. There are no 
Wendy's. There are no Burger Kings. There are no Whataburgers around. There's no place to eat there in the, in the desert. And so the disciples said, we can't help them. Let's get them away from here. Send them away. Move them along. And really, I think that's the attitude of a lot of churches toward people today. It, it really is the attitude toward the masses of people, toward people who have needs. And I don't think this is the case here, uh, thankfully, but there are a lot of churches, and most churches are interested in people who can give and who can tithe and who can be a part of the church and help build the church and contribute to the church. But, but how do we feel about people who are hungry? About people come and they have absolutely nothing to give to the church, but they come and they're hungry and they have nothing to eat. I think the attitude for a lot of churches is send them away. Get rid of them. And I want you to see what Jesus says we are to do. Notice he responds to the disciples in verse 37, and he says, give ye them to eat. And really the command of Jesus to the church in this verse, in the Greek language, is very strong. It's very emphatic. Really what Jesus said in the Greek language is, you give, you give them to eat, Jesus said to the disciples. In other words, fellas, these people are your responsibility. These people who are hungry, who have come uh, to you, are your responsibility. Now, men, do something about it. Give them something to eat. I'm sure at this point the disciples were perplexed. They look at this crowd of people, and by the way, there were at least uh, 5,000 people, perhaps even up to fifteen or 20,000 people. A big crowd. And by the way, this must be a very important miracle because this miracle is one of the few that's mentioned in all four of the Gospels. But these, these men didn't know how in the world they were going to do what Christ has commanded them to do. They didn't have the resources to feed fifteen or 20,000 people. As a matter of fact, they looked at what they had in their pockets and in their wallets and in their, their purses. And notice in verse 37, they said unto him, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Now, 200 penny worth of bread doesn't mean much to you and I, but I'll tell you, from what I read and what I understand, 200 penny worth was about half of a year's salary. In other words, it would have taken six, seven, eight months of salary to buy enough for them just to have a little something to eat, to feed this crowd. And yet Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, feed them, give them something to eat. I want to tell you that Jesus teached a very valuable lesson to his disciples that day. And that lesson is something that you and I better learn and ought to learn, friend, if we haven't already. And that is when God commands his people to do something, trust that God is going to provide the resources to make sure it gets done. Jesus was there, and, and for the hungry, there was going to be provision. And you know the story, the, how the little lad came with five barley loaves and two little fishes and presented that to Jesus, and Jesus took the two little fishes and the five barley loaves, and he blessed them. And then he gave them to the disciples, and he said, distribute these to the multitude. Feed the people. Oh, I can go see old Simon Peter. As he stands on one side of, the, of the, the, the people there, as he's got his basket with five loaves and two little fishes, and he passes it down the first row and says, get you something to eat. And it goes down a row of probably two or 3,000 people, comes back down another row of two or 3,000 people, gets back to Simon Peter, and he looks in thinking, surely the food is gone. It was gone after a few people, and there's five loaves and two little fishes still in the basket. He can't believe his eyes. He passes it again, it gets back to him, and the food is multiplied. There's more than what we started with. And, and uh, man, Simon Peter is dancing on the inside in his spirit. He is absolutely beside himself because of the miracle of God, the provision of the Lord. Friend, the lesson is very easy to see here, and that is what we give to Jesus. Jesus receives. And what Jesus receives, Jesus blesses. And what Jesus blesses, he multiplies. And so you and I bring our very little to Jesus and give it to Him. And don't think that just because we give a little that it's not much. He's able to make a blessing out of little and help a great multitude of people. I love the little song we sing during our mission conference each year, Little is Much When God is in It. And so Jesus looks at a hungry world, a hungry world about us. And He says to our little church, Give ye them to eat. Feed them, feed them. That is a command of Jesus to those of us who would do His will, to those of us that would be obedient to His voice. 
Let's talk about physically hungry people. We live in a city of hungry people. We live in a community, an area of Houston where there are hungry people. People that are physically hungry. And boy, I am grateful for the ministry of this church in feeding the hungry. We've got a food pantry. And by the way, let me just throw this in here. The food pantry is running low on food. And so if you could help us out with that, that would be a real blessing. But it's almost every week. Monica can attest to this where that doorbell rings and someone is there asking for food. And, and if that's all they ask for is food, we don't turn them away. We don't turn them away. We give them food. And if we don't have enough in the food pantry, we'll get their address and go buy the groceries and deliver it to them that same day. When they come and they say we're physically hungry, they're giving something to eat. Because I believe, brother, that God expects the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to help those who have a physical need, who have nothing to eat. I believe God wants us to reach out to people like that. But not only are there those who are physically hungry, but there are those about us who are emotionally hungry. I think about people today who are hungry for love. People today who are hungry for acceptance. People today who are hungry for friendship who are hungry for the grace of God, who are hungry for forgiveness, who are hungry for somebody to show that they care about them. Even on the rolls of our church today, there are plenty of people who are hungry, perhaps even, even present in this congregation, for somebody to reach out to them, to touch them, to care for them, to love them, to know that they're alive and that they are important and that they are a part and that they're needed and that they're wanted to reach out to them with the love of Jesus Christ and feed that emotional need. But then there are those about us certainly who are spiritually hungry, who are spiritually hungry. There is a hunger that no food will ever satisfy. And not only do we feed people physically, and not only should we feed people emotionally, but boy, we better give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. We better give them the bread of life. And Jesus said, if you'll eat this bread, you'll never hunger again. Give them the water of life. Jesus said, if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And friend, all of us, around all of us, there are those who are spiritually starving in their hearts. That's why we ought to do everything we can. Everything in the life of our church ought to involve reaching out to people who are hungry spiritually, who are starving spiritually, and give them the truth of the Word of God. Provide for them the bread of life and the water of life. Why? Because Jesus commanded us, give ye them to eat. Give ye them to eat. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know something. When you give your tithe and you give your mission offering on Sunday morning, you are giving hungry people something to eat. You're giving hungry people something. that You're giving them physical food, certainly. But you're, more than that, you're giving them spiritual food. And you're providing for them, as Jesus said. Oftentimes we look at our little tithe or our little, our little amount of money that we put in an envelope or we give online and we think, boy, this is nothing. This is nothing. But boy, when we place that in the hands of Jesus Christ, He multiplies it like He did the loaves and the fishes and He distributes it. And it goes out and it touches hundreds and thousands of lives. People you and I don't even know. Jesus said, give ye them to eat. For the hungry, Jesus gives his provision. But there's another crisis in this chapter. And that is for the helpless. He gives his presence. Notice in verse 45, it's the story of Jesus walking on the water to go to the disciples. You know the story well. The story begins with Jesus commanding his disciples to, to get into the ship, to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And verse number 45 says that Jesus constrained them to do that. Notice verse 45. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. The word constrained is a very strong word in its original language. It's the will of God. He ordered them to. It was, it was an order. And here are these disciples. They're being pressed by the multitudes and, and by the paparazzi. And so Jesus says, hey, get in your boat, get in your ship, go to the other side, and perhaps you can find some solitude, you can find some rest over there. And so they're obedient to the will of Jesus. They get into the ship, they go to the other side, and notice what the Bible says in verse 46. When Jesus had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And so the picture here is the disciples on the sea. Now, uh, if you've never been to the Holy Land, then perhaps you're thinking about a big body of water. 
One of the, uh, the benefits of going and taking that trip is it puts things into perspective for you. When you get to the Sea of Galilee, it's a lake. It's a small lake, the Lake of Galilee. You can see the other side of the sea. It's not like going to Galveston and looking at the water and all you see is water as far as your eyes can see. You, you can look across to the other side. And so that puts into perspective how big this storm would have had to be. And so the disciples are on the sea. They're in the will of God. A storm arises on the sea and Jesus is there on a mountain praying for them. No doubt, here's a picture of the intercessory ministry of Jesus. The Bible says when Jesus died and rose again, he went to the right hand of God, God the Father, and he ever lives to make intercession for us. That means at this very moment, and boy, this is comforting to me, Jesus is in heaven praying for me while I preach. Jesus was in heaven praying for Karen while she sang, and that means that Jesus is in heaven praying for you and praying for the needs in your heart today. It's his job his job. He knows the storm you're going through. He knew the disciples would come into a terrible storm and yet it was at the same time it was his will that they go through it. It's not always easy to obey the will of God, is it? It's not always easy. I, I talked to someone just this week, a member of our church who is serving God, who is so faithful to the Lord, but they're going through a difficult time. A difficult time. They are being put through the ringer. They're going through a struggle. They're going through a lot of reverses in life. They're having all kinds of storms in their life, and yet it's someone who loves God, and they're serving God. And somebody may say, well, I thought when you gave your life to Christ that the storms of life would be over. No, friend, the Bible never teaches anything close to that. Sometimes it's hard to obey Jesus Christ. Sometimes you're taught to obey Jesus in the midst of the storm. And to continue to be faithful in the midst of a storm, even when you think you're going to go under. That's when your faith is really put to the test. Here are these disciples. The storm came on the Sea of Galilee. The Bible says they're there toiling. I, I mean, they're toiling on the sea. And the word toiling, if you'll look at it, it literally means, it has the idea of being tortured. They're tortured. That storm is just letting them have it. It's beating them to death. They thought at any moment they would go under. I've preached this passage on a few occasions for sure. Jesus walking on the water, Peter walking on the water to go to Jesus. But I'll show you something that I never saw until I, I read it this week. Notice verse 47. It says, when even was come. Friend, Jesus didn't, he didn't immediately bail him out. He waited until the fourth watch of the night. He's, in the mountain, he's on the mountain praying for him. And he delayed his coming. And then when he did finally come, he scared him to death. Because he came walking on the water. And it frightened them. Can you imagine the sight of that sea? As it turns to concrete and Jesus starts walking out to them. Can you imagine their panic? Can you imagine their fear? Matter of fact, some of them wanted to jump overboard. Some of them cried aloud with fear in their heart. Do you know why? Because they were terrified. And do you know why they were terrified? Because Jesus didn't come at the time they thought he ought to come. And Jesus didn't come in the way that they all thought he should come. You and I get terrified all the time in the storms that life throws our way. And do you know why sometimes we're terrified? It's because Jesus comes to us in our storm in a totally unexpected way that we never thought he would come. And he allows us to come to that place of helplessness. And here are these disciples who, by the way, were skilled sailors. They're not rookies. They did this for a living, many of them. And I think the, when the storm first started coming, the rain started to fall, the, the lightning and thunder started to, to come in, they probably said, don't worry, fellas, we can handle this. We've done this numerous times. We've got it under control. We've been in hundreds of storms before. We'll make it fine. They thought they could do it without God. And do you know what happened? They came to a point where they finally said, we can't do it without him. We're perishing without him. And then in their helplessness, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came and he provided his presence. Listen, to the hungry he gave his provision, but to those that are helpless he gives his presence. And sometimes God will allow a major storm to come in your life and, and a problem in your life that is so great and so big and so powerful that it brings you absolutely to the point of desperation and helplessness. 
Many times it's then and only then when Jesus moves in in his in a mighty way and you see his presence and you see that without him you can't do anything but with him you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. For the helpless he gives his presence. For the hungry he gives his provision. But notice this third picture here, this, this third crisis. Not only do we see him providing for the hungry and not only do we see him giving himself to the helpless but we see Jesus as he moves for the hurting, and for the hurting, he gives his power. Notice down in verse 54 of this chapter, I think it is, yeah, verse 54 and 55, when, when Jesus gets out of the ship, notice it says in the latter part of verse 54, and straightway they knew him. Verse 55, and ran through that whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was. In verse 56, And whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid, in, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. For the hungry, there's his provision. For the helpless, there's his presence. But now for the hurting, there is his power. Hurting people were attracted to Jesus like honeybees are attracted to honey. Jesus just drew hurting people to him. Did you know that there are a lot of hurting people in this building today? A lot. It would blow your mind. It would blow my mind if you and I had any kind of comprehension of the heartaches and the troubles that are just present in this room alone. There are hurting people around us. There are hurting people in this world today. This world is filled with hurting people, people who have been damaged, people who have been broken, people whose lives have been shattered. There are people, as I said, in this auditorium who have had their financial world shattered, who have had their family world shattered, who have had their, their marriage shattered. They're broken, they're bleeding, they're hurting. Just one phone call, just one week, and their world has tumbled down upon them. They're hurting. And I want to tell you today that Jesus has an answer for hurting people. Jesus is the answer, friend. He has an answer, and it is His power. And the Bible says that, that here are these people, and they come, and they say, if I could only touch the border of His garment, and the Bible says as many touched the border of His garment were made whole. And don't misunderstand the text here. Well, they weren't healed by that touch. They were healed by the one they touched. Uh, a lot of times we talk about faith, and we're, say, we're saved by faith, and I know what we're talking about. But faith has to be put on the right person. It has to be faith in the right object, grace. Grace. It's not the fringe of his garment that saved them. It wasn't the fingers of their hands, but it was faith in Jesus that brought his power to them. Today, friend, if you're hurting, if you're a broken person, I'll tell you, Jesus is in the business of mending broken hearts. He's in that business, and business is good. He's in the business of lifting broken spirits. He's in the business of healing broken lives. And I don't know what your hurt is. And no matter what your hurt is, the Bible says everyone who reached out to him, who touched him, was made whole. You know, with, without Jesus, you're not whole. You're not complete. That means something is missing. Something's not right. Something needs to happen in your life. And there are many of you here this morning that you're not whole. There's a void in your heart, and that void is none other than Jesus Christ. And you need to understand, friend, that without Jesus, you're not going to make it through what you're going through. Something is missing, but if you'll touch him, the touch of faith, the Bible says you'll be made whole. The moment they reached out and touched him, his power healed their hurt. And it doesn't matter what your hurt is today. It doesn't matter. If you'll reach out and you'll touch Jesus and believe in Jesus and commit your life to him and bring your hurt to him, Jesus will heal your hurt. So I ask you today in closing, are you hungry? Are you hungry? For the hungry, there's provision. Are you helpless? For the helpless, there's his presence. Are you hurting? Are you hurting? For the hurting, there is power. There is the power of Jesus Christ. With our heads bowed and our uh, as we bow together for prayer. Tell you what, again, I don't ever do this. Can we sing that great song? If it's in our songbook, How Great Thou Art. Is that in our songbook? Boy, he's a great God. A great God. And right now, he lives to touch your 
life. So what do I do, Pastor? Reach out and touch him with a finger of faith. That's it. That's it. You've got to make that move. You've got to make that decision. Here were people who were hurting. But they had to be brought to Jesus. They had to get to Jesus. They had to come to Jesus. And friend, that's what you have to do today. That's the requirement for you to, to have that need in your life met. You must approach Him. He won't force Himself on you. He won't force Himself. Someone said He's a perfect gentleman, and no doubt He was. Still He is, and friend, He's not going to intrude, but He does stand at the door and knock. He wants you to open the door. And if you'll open it, He'll come in and sup with you. And you with Him. Friend, if you're hungry, there's provision. Whether you're spiritually, mentally, physically hungry, there's provision if you trust in Christ. If you're helpless this morning and you just don't know what tomorrow is going to hold and boy, you just don't know that you want to face another day, come to Him and you'll find in His presence it will be all that you need. If you're hurting, reach out and touch Him. Father, bless this invitation. In Christ's name I pray, amen. You got